Well, it's great to be with you all this evening. I know that you got to hear a few little things about me earlier, um, but one of the fastest ways I think that you can become friends is by telling an embarrassing story. So I think I need to tell you one of my most embarrassing stories. So um, my husband and I had been married for about a year, and we bought our first house. We'd been living in a rental. And so we um, were packing everything up. We were getting ready to move. It was the night before our move. And we'd been living in this darling little house in our town that was like 100 years old, very cute, very charming, but lots of noises, like creaks in the floor, things like that. And so, I mean, I'm kind of a jumpy person. So there were many times throughout the, the time that we lived there that I would get a little bit freaked out. But this last night in our house, it was like 10.30. We were just finishing up all the packing. And uh, all of a sudden, we heard noises like we had never heard before in the house. It was like footsteps, like progressively louder and louder and louder and faster and faster right outside of our, our bedroom door. So my husband being the valiant husband that he is, he just ran over and just slammed the door as hard as he could. And then we, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we kept looking back and forth, and we're like, what are we going to do? Because we were convinced there was someone in our house. So we ran. I just grabbed him. We ran into the walk-in closet, and I immediately grabbed my phone, and I just called 911. I was like, there's somebody in here. So they're like, okay, we're going to send, we'll send some officers over, just wait. So as we're standing in the walk-in closet, listening intently, my heart is racing, we don't hear anything. So either I'm like, okay, there's maybe nobody here, or, or, maybe, or maybe the burglar is standing completely still just like this, without moving a muscle outside our door. I don't know, I don't know. So we waited, and then finally the, we heard a knock on the front door, and the, the police called back and said, We're, we have an officer outside. And so Mike went to go open the door, and I'm starting to feel a little bit embarrassed, like, oh, maybe there's not actually anybody in here. And then I looked down, and I realized that I'm wearing the Christmas pants. Let me tell you, it was May, and I was wearing these Christmas pants. This blessed woman that we knew from our church had made us matching pajama pants, flannel, when we got married as our, as our wedding present. And I'll tell you what, they were so big. Like, the legs were just massive. I loved wearing these pajama pants because they were like a blanket that I could, like, wrap around myself, like, five times. So I'm like, oh, no, there's probably nobody here, and I'm wearing the, the Christmas pants. This is mortifying. <laughs> So Mike's walking around the house with the police, and I'm just waiting. I'm, like, peeking out, so embarrassed. Finally, they leave, and he comes, and he goes, Carly, come with me. I have to show you something. So we went out right outside of our bedroom, and we saw a stack of flat moving boxes. My best friend had brought over some brand new moving boxes that had never been opened or or unfolded before, and so they were just perfectly flat, and she had set a whole stack of them up against the wall right in front of the air conditioning vent, so when that went off at 10.58 p.m., they slid down one after another after another after another, sounding like footsteps. So, all was okay, but now to this day, we say that We had a box burglar in our house. (laughs) So it was a very embarrassing story, but I tell you that because I so easily can have anxiety hijack my brain. Does anyone else have that? I mean, I think that there are many of us, thank you for being brave to raise your hand, I think that there are many of us who struggle with anxiety, myself included. I have had a struggle with anxiety for a long time, where irrationality, where quick fear, where worst case scenario thoughts just come into my brain so easily and create these inner storms. But I, like I said, I don't think that that is just a me thing. I think that many of us struggle with anxiety. And I think that generationally, we are seeing that more and more of us struggle with, with fear, with worry, with stress, and anxiety. There is a counselor who I have learned a lot from. Her name is Sissy Goff. She is a a Christian counselor who counsels kids and teens. And she says this, anxiety causes us to overestimate the power of the problem and underestimate ourselves and our ability to cope. 
Don't you think that's true? That anxiety really heightens and makes us feel like the problem is too overwhelming and we can't do anything about it. Well, I think that this is a reminder to us that sometimes the problem feels really big. And we do face lots of problems. We face things that are stressful and difficult and challenging. We, we face storms. But the good news is that anxiety does not have to be our boss, right? And that in order for us to find the peace that we desperately need, and the peace that we're looking for doesn't require more planning and problem solving. It doesn't require us striving and working and trying harder and gritting our teeth and picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. It doesn't require any of that. But to find the peace that we desperately need, all we need to realize is that Jesus' presence is with us in the storms. And it's the presence of Jesus with us that can shift our perspective and really help us live with rest. And I think that this is the gift that Jesus was wanting to give to the disciples in the story that we're going to be looking at tonight. The gift of peace, knowing that even in the midst of the storms that they're not alone and that Jesus' presence can shift their perspective. So we're going to be looking at a scripture tonight from Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading in the Common English Bible starting in verse 35. It says this, Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose, and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat, sleeping, sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, teacher, don't you care if we're drowning? Don't you care that we're drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind. And he said to the lake, silence, be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. And Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So let's unpack the scripture together for a few minutes. So first we find that Jesus and his disciples are in this boat. And Jesus has actually been in the boat all day. Jesus has been teaching, as we read earlier in Mark chapter 4, that he's been teaching. There's such great crowds of people that have come to listen that he had to get into a boat and get out into the lake a little bit so that he could be seen and heard by all these people who had gathered on the shore. Well, then after that, Jesus and his disciples get into this boat and they start to go across the lake. And they're headed for Gentile territory which this would have made the disciples incredibly uneasy and very uncomfortable because Gentiles in their tradition were supposed to be avoided. They were supposed to be kept at a distance. They were considered unclean, but yet Jesus was taking them to the Gentile territory. So this alone had to cause their stomachs to churn a bit. But then it's in the middle of the night and they're going across to Gentile territory They're already, you know, having questions about this whole thing. And then this storm comes up. The storm that when we look at the original language in scripture, it actually paints the picture of like tornadoes on water. I mean, this is, these are intense storms and it's in the middle of the night. Everything is always worse in the middle of the night, right? The stress, the fear, you can't see things very well. And so they are panicking, They go into problem-solving mode. They're trying to figure out how to fix the situation and make sure that they can make it through. So they are looking to each other. They're looking to how to fix things on the boat. They're just absolutely rushing around frantically trying to figure out how to survive. They're panicked. They're afraid. And the whole time, Jesus is asleep. He's asleep on a pillow when they are panicked. What a unique contrast, right? 
And so finally, someone probably, one of the disciples probably says, like, wait, where's Jesus? Is he tying down the sails? No, he's asleep? So the disciples go over to him, and they yell, and out of anger and frustration and fear, they yell out, we are about to drown. Don't you care? Don't you care, Jesus? And maybe some of you in the room tonight have felt this way. Maybe some of you even have cried out, don't you care, Jesus? Don't you care that I'm in the middle of the storm? Where are you? What are you doing? Don't you care? Maybe some of you have felt forgotten in the middle of a time when your family was falling apart. Maybe you have felt forgotten or like wondering if God actually cares when you have been feeling sad beyond repair. Maybe you have said, God, don't you care that I didn't get into the college that I was really hoping for, and now what am I going to do? My future is all question marks. Don't you care? Or maybe some of you in the midst of your anxiety that just feels like it will never, ever go away, and that anxiety that's causing the storms in the middle of the night, maybe it's in those times where you're saying, don't you care, God? Don't you care? Do you see me? Can you help me? If you've asked those kind of questions, know that you're not alone. And know that God is actually not offended by those kind of questions. That God wants us to be authentic and real and honest and he can handle all of that. And I was in a season of my life about 10 years ago where I was feeling absolutely desperate for God to intervene in my storms of anxiety. And I felt like the disciples. I'm struggling. I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to problem solve. I'm trying to plan my way out of this. I'm working so hard. And Jesus, where are you? I was so anxious. I remember just laying on the floor in my living room, just crying out to God and saying, please, God, can't you take away my anxiety? And I had prayed that over and over, and my anxiety didn't go away like the flip of a switch. And I found that to be really frustrating and aggravating and confusing. And this went on for a while, and One one particular summer, I was driving up to a camp where I was going to talk about the university where I was working at the time. And I remember sitting in the back of the chapel service. And it was in this season where I was just eaten up by anxiety, where I was so full of fear. And I remember just sitting in the back once again, just crying out to God and saying, God, please, Will you please take away this anxiety? And in that moment, I felt like the Lord, I can still picture it right now. In in that moment, I felt like the Lord just gently reached out his hands and put them on the sides of my face. Like cupping my face in his hands and he looked so tenderly in my eyes. Sometimes God, God speaks to me through like pictures in my head, like my, through my imagination, almost like a movie in my brain. And in that moment, I felt like the Lord said, Carly, I'm inviting you to know me. I'm inviting you to know me. And I had grown up in the church. I had followed Jesus for as long as I could remember I had such a heart to want to follow God and honor God and pursue God's plans for my life. But there was something missing, a friendship. I was working so hard trying to do everything right and and those gold stars and making sure that I didn't let anybody down, including God. But I had missed just the love of God, the rest that it could be found in friendship with Jesus. And so in that moment, Jesus was saying, I'm inviting you to know me as your counselor and your comforter and your friend and your prince of peace. And so that day started a shift for me. I didn't have an instant, instant change where the storm just went away in the moment. And God can do that. 
God can heal instantly. But sometimes in God's kindness, God doesn't heal us instantly because in my situation, it almost would have been like putting a Band-Aid on a wound that was needing to be cleaned out. And for me, the messages of perfectionism and finding my identity in performance and being afraid to fail and all of those things, it was like the Lord started to gently clean out those habits and those coping mechanisms and those wounds And in God's kindness, God took me on a healing journey. But it was all through knowing Christ. It was all through knowing that God's presence was with me. That then one day at a time, one moment at a time, I began to walk a different kind of road. A road of rest and peace. Knowing that I didn't have to earn God's love, but I already had God's love. And that I also had Jesus with me as my friend. And I think that that is what Jesus wanted the disciples in the boat to know. Was that he was saying, I'm inviting you to know me. Don't look at the face of the storm, but look into my face. And know that I am with you. I am full of so much peace that I can sleep in a storm. And so if your default setting is to look to me first, then I can help you have a different kind of reaction to your storms too, and I can help shift your perspective. I do think it's interesting that when the disciples yell at Jesus and say, like, don't you care? We're going to drown, that he gets up and he actually doesn't even address that right away. But first, he addresses the storm. He goes and speaks directly to the thing that is scaring them. And he speaks to the storm and calms the storm. And he shows the disciples, shows his friends that he is bigger than the thing that is scaring them. That he's not shaken by what has been shaking them. That he has authority over the storm. And then he says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And sometimes when we read this scripture, we can kind of hear different tones of voice. We can be like, almost, almost insinuate that Jesus is like, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? Kind of like rude, condescending, judgy. But I don't think that's what Jesus sounded like. I think Jesus was kind and compassionate and tender as he asked those questions like, why? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? See, I think that he was wanting to help them address their fears, not suppress them, but to address them. What what was underneath the surface of their franticness and their panic What was underneath the, the, like, why don't you care? What were the fears? You know, maybe some of the fears that they were feeling were like, oh, my goodness, I've left my job, and I have left my security, and some of my friends and family think I'm crazy for following Jesus, and now I'm just going to drown for all of this? What is the purpose of this? That may have been a fear underneath. So there was questions swirling around and fear that was driving those kind of reactions. And so in Jesus' kindness, he's like, all right, let's address it. Let's address the thing beneath the thing because that is what is actually eating you alive. So he invited them instead of suppressing their fear to address it and to name it. And so I think that that is what Jesus is inviting us to tonight too. To actually address the thing that we're afraid of. Sometimes we're afraid to look at the thing that we're afraid of in the face. We want to shove it down. We want to distract ourselves. We want to numb out. But what if we address it so that we can bring it to the surface so that Jesus can actually say, I'm with you in that. And I want to help you. And I want to heal you. Because sometimes our fears can lead us to unhealthy coping mechanisms. I mentioned a couple of those a minute ago, numbing out, distracting ourselves. But here are a couple other examples where our healthy desires, oftentimes things actually start as our healthy desires, actually can lead us to unhealthy coping mechanisms. So here are a couple examples for you. Maybe you fear being alone. 
and forgotten, and you desire to have connections with people, but then you find that through unhealthy habits on your screen late at night. Maybe you fear failure and you desire to do really well and be excellent in school and in athletics or music, whatever your thing is, but you slide into perfectionism and you find your identity in performance and that becomes unhealthy. I know that story well. Or maybe you fear being rejected and you desire to be valued by others, which is a healthy desire. But then an unhealthy coping mechanism comes in to try to soothe that fear that you find yourself making decisions that you know are not the best, most healthy decisions, and you throw your moral compass out the window just to be accepted by a certain group of friends. See, when we try to meet our own needs with our own strength and our own perspectives, we can oftentimes choose relationships and habits that are not helpful, but they're actually harmful. All to soothe our fears, but we know that that is a temporary thing. And that temporary satisfaction, trying to meet our own needs with our own strength, is actually what leads us to sin. And oftentimes in our cultural moment, we don't like to talk about sin. We're like, ooh, judgy, rude. But here's the thing. Jesus talks about sin because Jesus cares about us. He doesn't want us to try to soothe our, our, our fears or meet our needs on our own in ways that are only going to lead us to harm and destruction. And so that's why Jesus takes it so seriously to remind us that sin is only going to hurt us, not help us. But sometimes it feels like sin is so heavy and the chains that we carry are so immense that we don't know how to get out of it. Or maybe it's not that you're feeling stuck by your own chains, but maybe it's somebody else's sinful, selfish choices that have hurt you. That you're reeling from that because you've just been in the zip code of, the same, of this person who has, who has caused these hurtful choices that you are now feeling the effects of. And that's the thing, too, about sin is that sin is individual, but it's also communal. When, when sin happens, it doesn't just hurt the person who's making the choice, but it hurts the people around them. And that is all why God takes sin so seriously. Because God does not want us to be harmed. God wants us to be healthy, whole, and holy. So when Jesus talks about sin, it's not because he wants to shame us, but he actually wants to free us. We see that on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, his self-sacrificial love conquered the power of sin and made right relationship with God possible and others possible. And there's nothing that we need to do to earn this free gift of forgiveness and salvation and grace. We don't have to do anything. We just get to receive, and I know you talked about that, that posturing of receiving from Jesus. You talked about that last night. So the greatest storm, the power of sin, has been conquered, praise God, by Jesus' death and resurrection. And so then we can be freed, and we can also be fulfilled. We don't have to search for things to fill us in unhealthy ways. We don't have to try to soothe our fear or anxiety in unhealthy ways, but instead we can have our perspective changed because we know that the presence of God is with us. Sometimes I wonder what this story would have been like if the disciples would have had a default setting to look to Jesus first. Because they went to problem solving, they went to their own efforts and their own work first, and that was their first default setting. But what if their default setting would have been to look to Jesus first? They would have seen that Jesus was unafraid. They would have known that his presence was at peace even in the storm. And so that's what we're invited to tonight. That we can't change our default setting on our own, but Jesus can help us change our default setting to look to Jesus first. 
so that then we can follow in his posture of rest. Tonight, as you're thinking about the fears that you carry and how maybe you have been trying to problem solve your way out of panic, how would that shift for you to see Jesus is with you? He's so peaceful that he's asleep. How does that change the perspective of the storm? How does that change the way that you feel like you can move through the storm? And how does that change the way that you have hope for the future? We serve a God who says, I am right here with you. Jesus doesn't run away from suffering, but runs toward suffering for our sake. So right where you are, Jesus is with you. And he is singing songs over you to bring you to freedom and to fill you up. In the 1980s, there was a whale named Humphrey. And Humphrey was in the San Francisco Bay where he lived, where he, where he belonged, where he was healthy. But somehow, some way, instead of going back out toward the ocean, he started to make his way up a river. And this was not the place for a big whale like this in the fresh water, but in his panic, he just started to go further and further up the river. And all the people in the San Francisco area were really worried about this whale and wondering if they could help him turn around. And so they they brought boats into the river, and they tried to stop him and turn him, and this only made him panic more. They then started banging pipes, making these loud clangs in front of him to try to turn him around, and this only added to his frenzy, and he kept going up and up the river. And it felt like there was no way that he was going to get out. His panic and his own ability to try to problem solve was only leading him to further unhealth, and it was looking really grim. Well, finally, some people said, hey, what if we were to record some songs of some of the whales that are in the pod, that are in the ocean, that are probably his friends and family? What if we were to record some songs that would connect with his heart And connect with what he needs and let's put out some speakers into the water and let's play those in the direction that we want him to swim. So they tried it and lo and behold it worked. As they started to play the songs and stopped the banging of the of the pipes and the boats trying to stop him but as they just started to play the songs that he knew the songs that connected to his heart, he turned around, and it was the songs that led him to freedom, to restoration, and to wholeness. There's a lot of noise in the world, right? There's a lot of messages that feel like banging of pipes, things that distract us and add to our anxiety and our frenzy and our panic. The wind of our circumstances can feel incredibly overwhelming and it feels like anxiety can take hold real quick and create narratives in our minds and cause us to swim up the wrong streams. But in the midst of the noise, Jesus is singing over you. He isn't barking orders. He isn't clanging pipes but he's singing melodies over you that remind you that you are valued and loved and you're not alone. In the Old Testament, we read about this singing God in Zephaniah 3.17. And as I read this, I'm going to read it a couple of times. I want you to think about how this particular verse can bring you peace even in the midst of your storm, how you're reminded of God's presence with you. Zephaniah 3.17 says, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm your fears. 
He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I'm going to read that again. If you want to close your eyes and think about the words that stick out to you and how God may be speaking to you, you're welcome to do that. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And as you experience these songs and the calm that begins to come as we change the soundtrack of our minds, we may even say, who is this, God? Who is this? Just like the disciples, they experienced the calm and they were so amazed and so in awe and they said, who is this? And you may be asking that same kind of question tonight. And if you are still discovering who Jesus is, press in and hear with Jesus' hands on your face. He's saying, I'm inviting you to know me. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to problem solve, problem solve your way to peace. But know that I'm with you. My presence is with you. And I am inviting you to know me. And so what would it look like for you? here at MOVE this week, what would it look like for you to respond to that invitation? How is God prompting you to change your default setting, to not look at the face of the storm, but to look in the face of Jesus, the one who is inviting you to know him deeper? What would it look like for you to respond and take another step to know him? even tonight. Let me pray for us. God, we are so grateful that you are with us. There are storms that come, and some of these students may even be living and experiencing heavy, scary storms even now. But I pray that they would know that they are not alone, they are not forgotten that they are valued, seen, and known, and loved by you, and that you are with them. You are inviting them to know you in deeper ways. And so I pray that they would even be able to boldly address and name their fears tonight, instead of trying to suppress the fear or distract themselves or numb out. May they address the fears, bring it to you, And see that you are bigger than the fear. You're bigger than the storm. And you will help them find a way through. They don't have to do it on on their own. Instead, they can rest. They can rest in you. So will you help us, God, change our default setting so that we can rest. That we can find peace. Peace. In a world that wants us to panic, may we have peace because of your presence. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.